In Georgia, they arrested a drone operator for trying to drop pot into a correctional facility. In the last year alone, Heathrow, Gatwick, and the UAE's international airports have been shut down because of drone activity. These toys that 12-year-olds can operate are starting to have an impact on daily operations. An Olympic caliber skeet shooter can take down two clay pigeons in about two and a half seconds. Now imagine those clay pigeons to be drones. And instead of two drones, imagine it to be 50 drones littering the sky. It'll take two Olympic caliber skeet shooters about a minute to target all of those drones. What do you think the odds are of one of those drones leaking through and carrying out a nefarious mission? And let's be clear, our adversaries aren't using these drones as toys. They're not used to take pictures of your, the land you've been prospecting from your realtor. They're not used to take pictures from the eye of the inside of the hurricane. Russia just demonstrated a Kalashnikov that they're putting on the drone, and they're getting ready to start selling that to smaller armies. A joint technology team between South Africa and the UAE just demonstrated a six-chamber rocket propel grenade, and they're getting ready to start selling that to smaller armies. The face of war is changing. The cost and position is upside down. What you see in this clip is a billion dollars worth of ammo in the Ukraine being blown up. What you don't see is the thousand dollar hard to spot any 12 year old with D batteries can operate drone that dropped the munition to negate this armory. These are no longer toys. They're precision guided munitions. And any Joe Schmo with an Amazon account and a credit card can get their hands on one. So it's time to adopt some of these farther out technologies and some of these unconventional technologies, mate them together, and build a system that's capable. How successful do you think our AR-15s will be in all of those scenarios I just talked about against that threat set? How successful are, are our billion dollar fighter jets? They're not going to be. That's where Thor comes into play. Thor was designed to negate swarms of drones using speed of light effects. And we did it with personnel diversity, thought diversity, co-opting random people onto our team, unconventional funding streams, and a far out idea that people really got behind. In Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, she tells a story about a speaker who was taking questions. And uh, the speaker said, I don't have any more time for questions. And so everybody put their hand down. And one person kept their hand raised. And the, uh, the speaker called on that person, took the question, and left the stage. And one of the audience members caught up with the speaker later and they said, why did you take that last question? And the speaker said, quite simply, because that person kept their hand raised. So for this project, I kept my hand raised despite being the unconventional choice. I'm not an expert in high power microwaves. My PI will tell you I am still, after 18 months, not an expert in high power microwaves. They will also tell you that I was new to the division when I first started, so I didn't have a lot of street cred with the people that I was going to be asking to do work for me. And to top it all off, I had a lot, of, a lot going on at home. At the time, I had a two-year-old son and uh, twin six-month-olds. My six-month-old son came home on an oxygen tank. And my twin daughter came home, and we had to take her to the ER three or four times because of some issues she was having. So I couldn't travel. I really needed to be at home. But this was an opportunity to go all in on a project that had impact to the warfighter, not six years from now, but tomorrow. And for that, I kept my hand raised. The only thing I knew is that we had to deliver a thing called Thor in 18 months. So I talked to all of the experts, and they said there are two routes you can take. You can take the well-worn, well-demonstrated path, build, take a source that's already been built, bump up the power a little bit, wrap a system around it, slap an AFRL sticker on it, and call it good. Or you could flip the script, venture into uncharted territory, and build a source from scratch to execute the mission better. That well-worn, well-demonstrated path, we've been doing that for 10 years. It's almost rote for our team. Building a source from scratch, executing the mission better, was something that we hadn't genuinely worked on in about 15 years. The other flip side of that coin, though, is that we had longer standoff distances with, this, with the new source, and we'd have less collateral damage. So we're not causing more harm in the environment that we're radiating um, other than the drones that are, causing, uh, that are trying to target us. It also means that if you have an airman is standing in a building, they don't have to worry about the munitions from those drones dropping on them. It means larger standoff distances. It quite literally means more lives saved. And if it's my kids that are in a situation where they are being targeted by drones, I want that standoff distance to be as far as possible. And for that, we took the unconventional route, and we took the big risk. And we had an answer as long as we could build it. 
Just by virtue of the timeline, the odds were stacked against us. And on the off chance that we actually were able to build a system in that amount of time, could anybody get in the driver's seat and actually operate it? Because we can't send an engineer to every place that's have a pro having a problem with drones. So I gra gathered up all the millennials in our division and because uh, that's who's fighting our wars now, right? And I said, um, I said, if you had a system, how would you operate it? And so after about two hours in a conference room, I walked out with a sketch of a user interface that wouldn't be a far stretch for the Mario Kart experts that are operating our wars now. I started using that user interface and calling it the Thor video game in an, in an effort to try to explain to people how the system would be used in an operational environment. It was so successful, as a matter of fact, that my management um, pulled me aside and asked me to change the name because Thor Video Game was not quite professional enough. So it's now the Advanced Microwave High Power something or the other. But, um, but the next thing we had to do was actually take that Thor Video Game and get some users in this seat to explain to them how the system would be used and to, make, and to see if what we had generated in the lab made sense out in the field. So I paid for some TDY for some folks to come out to my contractor facility, and I said, uh, this is the way the system works. You touch here, you swipe here, you ping there. You know, this is how the drop-down menus work. And there was a lot of feedback, and there was a lot of um, input saying we should change modules here and, and, and rearrange things, but for the most part, we had it right. Um, and about halfway through the day, there was an E3 in the back of the room, and he raised his hand, and he said, ma'am, and I said, yes, sir, and he said, I eat Cheetos when I work, and I, Okay, I like Doritos, but um, he said, uh, after the third shift, that screen is gonna be so dirty, it's not gonna be usable. And I said, oh my goodness, my, my system won't get used because of Cheetos, right? So now we've made it Cheeto-proof, right? It's mouse-enabled and it's touchscreen-enabled because you have to build a system that the warfighter is gonna be able to use, right? So at the end of the day, um, we had At the end of the day, this is the way we kept co-opting people onto our team, right? You have an expertise, let me talk to you. You have an expertise, let me talk to you. In my division, we came up with a verb over the course of the last 18 months. And it essentially said, if somebody wasn't successful or hadn't completed some form of work that they were supposed to do, they said, well, I just got thored, right? And that's exactly as it should be. We should contract and swell our workforce until we get the job done. Everything about this project needed a rethink. We had to change the way we did our modeling and simulation. We had to change the timelines in which we had, we had to test the hypotheses. We had to change the timelines that vendors had to get us hardware back in order for us to test. As a matter of fact, we tried additive manufacturing because um, we wanted to cut the acquisition timelines. We failed so spectacularly at this that we won an, an award at the Air Force, Le Secretary Air Force level for um, biggest failure, right? Um, <laughs> but we couldn't stop there. We had to keep building, we had to keep making things to build the right system for the warfighter. We were leapfrogging ourselves. We would have something uh, operating in the chamber and we would be bu building versions two, three, and four in order to get the right thing built. Born out of a need to create a capability, people kept asking, that was our desire, right? I I'm trying to make sure that you understand that our desire was to build something that worked. Um, people kept asking us, is it going to get out sooner? Can you make it smaller? Some people were asking if we could even make it at all. And I was asking my team if they were ready to work weekends because the deadline didn't change. And the reason so many people started to care about what we were building is because there are now Washington Post reports about swarm attacks on, Syrian, uh, on Russian air bases in Syria. So the, at the beginning of this talk, I was talking about all the missed flights at Heathrow. And now we're talking about the loss of life because of these drones. So born out of a need to create a capability that would provide a utility to the warfighter and tip the balance in our favor, we succeeded where people thought we'd bitten off too much. I was told in the very beginning by my PIs that, Amber, it takes two years just to build a source, let alone a system. And in 18 months and two weeks, we built that system. We killed it. <laughs> we did. Um, and the reality is, is that we can't keep choosing the same people to do the projects. We can't keep executing the projects in the same way. We cannot keep leveraging the same old technology and expect to keep our edge. We've got to take the risk. We've got to take, do the unconventional thing, do, make the unconventional choices 
because we as a nation aren't going to survive if we don't continue to do the things that make us address that unconventional threat.